Hi, it's Katrina. Number 10. Stone Age Textiles Around 9,000 years ago, there were about 10,000 people living in the Stone Age city of Katalhuyuk in what is now Turkey. According to archaeologists, this was the largest known city from the Neolithic period anywhere on the globe. It was here in 1962 that archaeologists uncovered a piece of cloth, which sparked a debate over what these ancient people wore. As it turns out, people in the Stone Age were actually pretty good at making sophisticated clothing. The original argument was over what material was used to make the clothing. How did people start making clothes thousands of years ago? Was it wool or linen? These scraps of cloth found dated back to roughly 8,500 years ago. In 2017, researcher Bender Jorgensen took a closer look and found that the cloth was actually made from bast fibers the same material used to craft things like rope and yarn. This fiber came from oak trees, which prehistoric people managed to fashion into wearable clothing. How they figured out how to take bark from a tree and turn it into a shirt is a mystery in and of itself, but they did it nonetheless. In the largest city in the world before Babylon or Egypt, human beings made their clothes from the fibers woven from trees. And now for number eight, but first, I want to give a big thank you to Truebill for sponsoring this video. If you have a lot going on and are struggling to stay on top of everything like me, then Truebill might be really helpful for you. Do you wish you had an easier way to stay organized than leaving sticky notes everywhere and trying to find spreadsheets that you made a year ago? Then why not try Truebill? Truebill is the all-in-one personal finance app that empowers you to take back control of your financial life, helping you save more and spend less. I have all kinds of subscriptions to magazines, documentary streaming services, and who knows what else because of all the research we do for Origins Explained. Truebill will track all of your subscriptions in one place and can cancel ones you don't want or don't use. And it will even negotiate bills for you. It makes adulting a little bit easier and can monitor your credit score in case something unexpected happens. I've had my identity stolen before, and trust me, you need to stay on top of your score just in case. So give Truebill a try. Go to truebill.com slash origins explained or click the link in the description box below because we all could use a little extra help, don't you think? Number 9. Ancient Israeli Winemaking Archaeologists in Israel were excavating the town of Yavne when they discovered a massive winemaking complex that dates back over 1,500 years. The complex has shown that ancient Israelis could make wine that was just as delicious if not better, than we can today. The find included five wine presses, multiple warehouses, and kilns that were used to produce storage vessels made of clay. And of course, they found tens of thousands of pieces of jars that had been involved in the winemaking process. According to the Israel Antiquities Authority, this new discovery proves once and for all that the city of Yavne was the epicenter of winemaking in the Byzantine period. They could produce at this facility upwards of 2 million liters or 520,000 gallons of wine every year. According to John Seligman, one of the main directors at the excavation, the wine produced here was exported across the entire region. It was called Gaza wine, a prestigious light white wine that would have been consumed by the richest kingdoms around the Mediterranean. Egyptian rulers and Greek philosophers would have all enjoyed this wine, as well as people living throughout Italy at the time. Here's what's really interesting about this find. 1500 years ago, Israel mastered the art of making wine and shipping it across the world. However, nobody had figured out how to create safe water to drink. This wine was wildly popular because it was also a source of nutrition. Rather than drinking frequently contaminated water, people preferred to drink wine because it was safer and better than getting sick. Number 8. Classic Greek Inventions The ancient Greeks invented a lot of things, from democracy to the Olympic Games. They had philosophers, they made the best dramas, and their mythology still lives on today. But they were also ahead of their time, technologically speaking. The Greeks invented all kinds of amazing things, even something as simple as the odometer. That thing in your car that tells you how far you've driven was made thousands of years ago by a Greek inventor for the purpose of measuring roads as they were getting built. 
The Romans also used the original odometer, which was a massive wheel set up on a kind of wagon that could be towed down the road to see how long it was. But the amazingly advanced inventions of the Greeks go way beyond that. Before the Greeks, people used sundials to see what time it was. The Greeks decided to incorporate water clocks instead to tell the time in an even more precise way. They created the clepsydra, a mechanical clock that could tell how many minutes and hours had passed. As water slowly flowed through the contraption, gears rotated and an indicator slowly rose to indicate how much time had passed. It was insanely effective and worked a lot like a stopwatch. In fact, scholars say that the Greek clepsydra was used at brothels in ancient Athens, so clients had a time limit when visiting their favorite ladies. It was also used in courtrooms. And later, the Hellenistic physician Herophilos used it to measure the heart rate of his patients. Number 7. Ancient Egypt and Their Godly Statues Sekhmet is one of the most common Egyptian deities that can be seen today in examples of stonework found in museums all over the world. While a lot of people obsess over how great the Egyptians were at building pyramids and temples and tombs, they were also great sculptors. They were so good at creating statues that many of them are still in perfect condition thousands of years later. There is no better example of this than the thousands of surviving statues of Sekhmet. Sekhmet was a lion-headed goddess, her name translating roughly to she who is powerful. She was the goddess of the desert sun, of war, of chaos, and even of healing. Egyptian myth says she was created from the fire of the god Ra's eye at the exact instant that he looked at the earth. He created her as a weapon to destroy humans when he saw how disobedient they were, not living in accordance with his laws. While she was a fearsome deity to behold, she was also quite photogenic. In ancient Greece, photogenic meant being interesting for sculptors to work into their art. Sekhmet was described as being terrifying, a woman with the head of a lion. Archaeologists have found thousands of amulets with her depiction on them, usually sitting on a throne and holding a scepter. But the most famous images of Sekhmet are from a collection of life-size statues carved during the 18th dynasty. This was under the rule of the pharaoh Amenhotep III. What's truly amazing is that the pharaoh commissioned somewhere around 730 statues of Sekhmet during his short reign, and most of them have survived. Considering he ruled from between 1386 to 1349 BC, 4,000 years ago, that's pretty impressive statue making on the part of the Egyptians. Number 6. Ancient India's Plastic Surgeons Plastic surgery is not a new invention or a modern luxury. Plastic surgery actually came about sometime around 2,500 years ago in ancient India. Yes, ancient Indians were the first inventors of plastic surgery, a medical miracle far beyond their time. The word plastic in plastic surgery refers to the Greek word plastikos, which means to mold. In the 6th century BC, an Indian physician by the name Sushruta became the father of surgery. He wrote one of the earliest works in the world on medicine and surgery. He documented over 1100 diseases, described how to use hundreds of plants medicinally, and wrote down instructions for performing many different surgical procedures. One of these procedures was the reconstruction of the human nose. The procedure that Sushruta wrote of in his medical book is the first written record of a rhinoplasty being performed, something that still happens today. The ancient physician detailed how a thick piece of skin from the forehead could be removed and then used to reconstruct the person's nose. Of course, the big difference between now and then was that the procedure wasn't done so that people could have a more aesthetically pleasing nose. These rhinoplasties were done because a lot of people had their noses cut off as punishment for being thieves or for sleeping with someone outside their marriage. To fix the issue, they went to surgeons who could fashion them a new nose from a piece of their forehead. What do you think of this ancient form of plastic surgery? Pretty scary, right? Especially when you could die from a bacterial infection or something. But it might have been worth the risk for some. Number 5. The Pre-Humans Scientists with NASA working out of the Goddard Institute for Space Studies 
along with experts from the University of Rochester, recently published a paper. In this paper, they suggest that there may have once been a race of technologically advanced beings on Earth before humanity ever existed. Forget about the Romans or the Greeks having advanced technology, there could have been an entirely different species millions of years ago with the same technology we have today, or even better. Adam Frank, professor of physics and astronomy, says there is no real way to know for sure if we are indeed the first technological species to ever live on this planet. He goes on to explain that we have only had an industrial society for around 300 years, yet complex life has been around for 400 million. In fact, Frank says that if humans went extinct right now, just gone into nothing, another civilization could arise millions of years from today and all traces of us would be gone. With this reasoning, he suggests some kind of technologically advanced humanoid creatures could have existed millions of years before today, but all trace of them is long gone. After all, it's difficult enough to find evidence of cultures that disappeared 500 years ago. If they had lived 500 million years ago, there is no way we would know about it. Number 4. Cavemen and their sticks Speaking of ancient humans, archaeologists recently discovered a wooden stick that was once thrown by a human ancestor 300,000 years ago. I know what you're thinking. A stick is pretty far from advanced technologically. But this stick is special, and it could prove that Neanderthals were developing technology beyond what we've ever thought them capable of. On the surface, it's a boring stick. It's a piece of brown wood that was pulled from some mud. But according to Jordi Serengeli from the University of Tübingen, calling the stick just a stick would be like calling Neil Armstrong's first step on the moon just a step. This stick was used by Neanderthals as a throwing device to kill animals like waterfowl and rabbits. It was a specialized stick, carved in such a way that it could be thrown end over end like a throwing star. It predates spears, arrows, slings, and any other kind of projectile weapon. It also shows how from the very first stirrings of humanity, we were striving to build better, more effective weapons. First, there was a stick to throw at a rabbit, then a rock and a sling, then an arrow, until ultimately the deadliest weapon of all, the nuclear bomb. Number 3. The Roman Siege Engine The ancient Romans won a lot of battles because they were able to very easily conquer other civilizations regardless of their fortifications. They did this by employing advanced military tactics as well as advanced siege machinery. Historians call it the Roman Siege Engine. The Romans developed their siege engine through brilliant engineering. They focused completely on functionality. It's true that the Greek architect Epimachus was the first to design the actual siege tower used first in the battle to take Rhodes in 304 BC. But the Romans improved upon it, making it significantly smaller and more effective. Using them for the first time when they besieged Iotapata in 67 AD during the Jewish War. But the Romans didn't just reinvent the siege tower, they also completely redesigned a lot of artillery machines. When they sieged a city, they used massive ballista machines and scorpions. Scorpions were small military weapons that could fling bolts. In a single legion, there would be 55 ballistae, 10 catapults, and heaps of scorpions firing massive lead balls like bullets. Then there was what the Romans did to coastal towns. By the first century BC, they had perfected using siege machines called samba to create a siege ship and invade from the sea with minimal resistance from the enemy. The Romans succeeded in building an empire because they were dramatically more advanced than any other European power at the time. Number 2. Syria and Damascus Steel When the Crusaders entered the Middle East in the 11th century, they came face to face with warriors who wielded swords made from a very impressive metal. The metal was so thin that the swords could cut a single strand of hair, yet they were still huge and imposing to the European warriors. No matter how many battles these swords were in, they remained incredibly sharp. It was as if they couldn't get dull even if you tried. 
Europeans eventually learned that the steel was coming from Damascus, the capital of Syria. And this is how the legend of Damascus steel was born. From what we know today, Damascus was able to create swords that were sharper and more effective than anyone else in the world because of special ingots. They acquired ingots of something called Wood's steel from Sri Lanka and India. Using these special steel ingots, as well as a secret production method, Damascus created the best swords in the world from between the 3rd century to the 17th century. All the way up until 1750, India continued to ship these steel ingots to the Middle East, but that was right around the time that swords became outdated and useless. Sword makers slowly went extinct since nobody wanted to buy them anymore. Before the year 1800, the knowledge of how to create Damascus steel weaponry was lost, and nobody has ever been able to replicate it since. Number 1. The Babylonian Tablet of Shamash the Babylonian Tablet of Shamash was discovered by archaeologists in the city of Sippar, Iraq in 1881. It's housed today at the British Museum, but was originally created sometime between 888 and 855 BC by King Nabu Abla Idina. It was discovered fractured into six small pieces, yet was still in surprisingly good condition, considering it was stashed in a terracotta coffer nearly 3,000 years earlier. The coffer that contained the smashed tablet was hidden beneath the floor of a temple. Archaeologists immediately knew it was important not only because of how well it was hidden, but because it depicts the sun god Shamash along with symbols of the sun and moon. The god can be seen wearing his horned headdress. The tablet is also inscribed with 15 different passages of cuneiform, one of the earliest forms of writing created in Mesopotamia and used by the Babylonians. The script on the tablet tells how the Temple of Shamash fell into disrepair, but how King Nabu Ablaidina built a new statue and fixed it up. The text describes what practices were going on at the temple, the rules that the priests had, and the dress code for entering. The reason the Tablet of Shamash seems like such an advanced artifact is that even 3,000 years ago, give or take a few hundred years, religious buildings had dress codes and regulations. It seems nothing much has changed throughout the millennia. Thanks for watching! Remember to hit that subscribe button if you haven't already and come back soon for more amazing videos! See you next time! Bye!